Right. Well, I was a, a Reuters correspondent, the youngest and the most junior, junior Reuters correspondent in Moscow in 1971, which was seven years after Nikita Khrushchev had been removed from power by the uh, leaders, including Leonid Brezhnev, who had decided that his behavior had become just too flamboyant and exaggerated. He was criticized for banging his shoe on a table at the United Nations uh, somewhere around 1960. He used to have huge parties in the Kremlin in which he would, to which he would invite foreign diplomats and journalists, and this was not considered uh, seemly. And um, generally, the Soviet leadership had got tired of him. But the context of Khrushchev was that he had taken over from Stalin, and he had uh, been responsible for a considerable thaw, which led to hu a lot of human rights being reestablished. It led to people who'd been uh, um, sent to labor camps or exiled to Siberia, being allowed to return home, to have their convictions wiped off the record, and this sort of thing. It was a hugely important period. He was also responsible for Alexander Solzhenitsyn being published very briefly inside the Soviet Union. Solzhenitsyn was the first novelist to write about the conditions inside the labor camps. And so this was a huge event. And then suddenly, in 1964, after he'd been in power for just over 10 years, he was removed. And he didn't quite disappear, but he almost disappeared. And there'd become a sort of tradition that every time there was an election, now there'd be elections to local elections, elections to the Supreme Soviet, there would only ever be one candidate, so there was never any uh, mystery about what was going to happen in the election, but everyone had to turn out and vote. And the foreign press had, st had taken to going to Khrushchev's polling station on election days to get a glimpse of him. And the police and the KGB security service would put up crush barriers to keep the press back. And they would shout out questions to Khrushchev when he appeared to vote, who would uh, just acknowledge them, say hello, and walk past, but he wouldn't answer the questions. But nobody ever really had a conversation with him. And then, uh, when I arrived in Moscow in 1971, there was an election coming up, would have been, I think, in June 1971. Um, my bureau chief asked me to go to the polling station, but he pointed out that we probably wouldn't see Khrushchev at all, that the previous year he had not turned up to vote, and that the word had been let out afterwards that he was sick and had voted in hospital. Now, I really can't remember what sort of election this was, whether it was Supreme Soviet, the Parliament, or a local election. But I turned up there, it was a very, very hot and sunny day. It was just off the Moscow Ring Road, um, it was about a 10 minute drive from my office and I turned up there and I was joined by a, uh, my competition who was correspondent from the Associated Press and an AP photographer. Now my advantage over the AP uh, reporter was that I spoke very good Russian and he spoke hardly any at the time. And um, we waited outside this polling station where there were the crush barriers, where there was the KGB, where there were the police. We waited and waited and waited. We waited for a total of four hours. And finally, we had a discussion. And we decided between us that we were wasting our time, uh, that we weren't going to get anywhere close to him, even if he did turn up, and that we should just forget it and go home. So we started walking off down the road, and the police relaxed, the KGB relaxed, and they started moving away from the crush barriers and we were walking down the road towards where we parked our cars and saw this black Volga coming round this corner towards us and I remember thinking could it be and I thought no that's you don't get that lucky and the car drove right up to us and stopped by us the back door sort of fell open and there was uh, Khrushchev's wife uh, Nina Khrushchev and she grabbed my arm, she said, he's here. And she uh, then took me to the front of the car, opened the front of the car, and Khrushchev was there in one of these baggy suits that he always used to wear, a big Panama hat, and I helped him out of the car. And he then put his, his right hand on my left shoulder, and I walked him to the polling station. And the car's driver was also a personality. It was Alexei Adjube who was uh, Khrushchev's son-in-law. And 
the son-in-law had been the editor-in-chief of Izvestia, and he had transformed Izvestia from being a dull propaganda rag into quite a lively newspaper in his time as, as editor. And Ajul Bey was a, a crucial person to, to Khrushchev throughout his career and, the, and after his retirement. And so uh, I, said to, I said to Khrushchev, who was leaning on me to, he was using me as support to get to the polling station. And meanwhile, the police and the KGB were running around all over the place. The, the officials from the polling station came up, the little girl with, a, with, a, with a, a bunch of flowers to give to Khrushchev. And we were walking along, and I said, what are you doing with yourself? And Khrushchev said, I'm a pensioner. What do pensioners do? And then, alluding to the fact that a year before his memoirs had appeared, which he had denied ever having written in the West, they were called Khrushchev Remembers, I said to him, have you written anything? And he said, no, I've never written anything. Now, technically, of course, he was telling the truth, because we all knew that his son-in-law, Ajube, who was walking right bes beside us, was the one who'd written these memoirs. So he was not, it was not a complete lie. And suddenly all these people turned up and they were saying, sh shouting, you know, good morning, Nikita Sergeyevich, and taking him off. And they took him into the polling station. And then I um, waited outside when he went in to vote. And he came out and we said goodbye. And I said goodbye to, to, to Nina, to his wife. And, um, and that was that. But of course what we didn't know was that Less than three months later, he was, he was going to die. He died the following September. So, as far as I know, I was the last foreigner ever to speak to him, even if it was a fairly short and um, uneventful meeting. But the amusing part of this, of the end of this thing, was that uh, I went off to collect my car, and I was driving back past the polling station, where the KGB and the police were, uh, Packing up, and they all turned around and waved as I passed because it seemed to be, they seemed to think that somehow I won the um, won this little contest, and they respected that, and so I got what I wanted. The, the, as far as I don't know how much they could hear of what was being said, but nothing uh, dramatic had been said, nothing that would upset the Soviet state had been said. 